This is one of the videos that a lot of people have been waiting very patiently for me to make. We're looking at valve covers right now because we're doing some destructive testing today. One of these is being sacrificed for science. It's not going to be that one because that one's going back on the GSX. I've got a couple of 1G valve covers on the left to pick from and oh hey, one of these says Hyundai on it. It's not that one either because that one I just picked out of the junkyard from a rare 93 1.6 liter car. That one came off of Plymouth Laser, and it's in pristine condition. I kind of don't want to mess it up. The Hyundai valve cover actually took the place of the one we're going to use for this, and I've already taken the liberty of grinding the baffles out of it. You can see that one side is blackened and filthy because of the location of the PCV valve and how the EGR valve cokes intake parts with burnt carbon from the exhaust. It's perfectly filthy and the perfect candidate for the rest of our tests today. The reason why it's perfect is because you watch me coat two used engine parts with Gliptol 1201 while harping on about preparation steps. We get it, right? I did it twice already. I'm sure you're tired of it by now. Someone pointed out though that my previous test samples were bunk and completely unscientific as examples for what chemicals may affect the adhesion properties of Gliptol. You know what? He's right. 100% right. My previous test samples were never covered in crankcase gases or carbon like the head and block have been. They weren't put through the same cleaning and degreasing steps that the block and head were. They weren't made out of cast aluminum or cast iron like the head and the block are. What good would they be as any kind of scientific example of the process that I demonstrated? They're not. They're not used engine parts. So that's why I'm not mad at the shop that baked the head for losing them. And here I go doing all these steps all over again on a used cast aluminum engine part so that I can most closely mimic the kind of materials and conditions that preceded traveling down this road in the first place. So I've scrubbed the valve cover with mineral spirits to break up and remove the carbon, scrubbed the entire crankcase area with steel wire wheels to strip out the stuck on gunk and abrade the surface of the aluminum. I wiped it out with mineral spirits, sprayed it down again, and blew it dry with compressed air. And once it was dry, I wiped out all the petroleum residue with denatured alcohol and coffee filters until they all came out clean. This is the exact same preparation that both the head and the block received. I wanted to show you this process so that you could feel assured that the test samples I use in this video will exhibit the same behavior that you'd expect to see on the block and in the cylinder head. I'm using all the same tools, the same brushes, the same paint, and the same techniques for transferring liquids to be applied and coating everything except for the flange surfaces. You probably remember that both on my block and my cylinder head, I used two coats of paint. So that's what it looks like after one coat. Do you see how the surface of the paint smooths out and sort of erases its own brush strokes? It does that when it goes on thick and fresh out of the can. You learn that after a while that as this paint solvent base evaporates and the paint thickens that the brush strokes can stick around or become a part of your finish like they're doing right there around the spark plug wells. The paint container you're working from thickens up within only five minutes in open air, so stir it often and apply it quickly. Don't answer your phone. There it is, that's one coat. After it's applied, it only takes minutes until it feels dry to the touch. It develops an outer skin though. The stuff beneath it has to gas out in order for it to dry out, and that takes a long time. So if you touch it and you leave a fingerprint in the surface, or if you can still smell it and it stinks, then it's still wet. It's dry once you can't smell it anymore. The smell can take days or weeks to subside depending on your climate. I let it dry completely in between coats. One week later I gave the valve cover its second coat. This was done in early August when temperatures in my garage were sustained above 80 degrees Fahrenheit to ensure that it fully dried. I put the second coat on gloopy and thick. You might ask yourself why I'd be doing that any differently after going through all this trouble. I don't care at all about making this pretty. If this product decides to peel off in layers in our testing, well I'd be overjoyed because that's a result. I don't think it will peel off in layers at all. I think this thicker, rougher second coat will more closely resemble a worst case scenario while still giving all the same surface preparation steps that I've demonstrated over time a really good workout. Now to let it dry for at least two weeks before baking it, like I did with the block and head. Did someone say baking it? Down? You know what that means? I get to play with the shop dog, right? What's up, Talon? Yes, that's Talon. I'm back at Look detective at coding again. Uh huh. Smell that. Can you get? You want both of them at the same time? You want both of them at the same time? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know what to do. I want to eat this, but give me some privacy, man. Eat your bone.
So I take my baked valve cover home and naturally it's dusty and I'll need to test an inexpensive and efficient means of cleaning coated parts. Introducing my new $80 power washer. Yeah, I used to have a different one, but it got run over. It's a long story, I didn't do it. The person responsible for it was nice enough to replace it though. Also, I'd like to introduce you to the testing phase of this video. We're going to try to do some destructive testing and see what this coating can endure. I say try because this stuff has a reputation for being extremely tough. Because the parts are coated, now instead of needing solvents and degreasers to clean them, I plan to just wash them out with a power washer and dry them. Not all power washers are created equally though. Some of them are more equal than others. There it is. That's two coats baked on right there. It's got a rubbery satin texture that feels silky smooth. It really does seem to darken to a more burgundy shade when it's baked. It wasn't baked in a clean room and then hermetically sealed afterwards, so naturally you'd have to clean it out before using it on an engine. What kind of results should we expect from a power washer then? Well, let's find out! From about a half a foot away, all it seemed to do was wash out all the dust. That cleaned up fast. If you do this against your skin, you'll end up with tap water in your bloodstream. What happens if we set it off at point blank range in one tiny little pinhole of a concentrated spot? Absolutely nothing. Not one single mark or blemish from that. Gliptol is tougher than your skin, apparently. You can't tell I held it point blank at all. You're perfectly safe using an electric power washer to clean parts that are coated with this product. Power washers that are designed to strip paint are typically gas-powered and run on pressures higher than 2500 PSI. This power washer is only rated for 1600 PSI and has two settings, on and off. Pressurized water will blast away oils, and you can see that water beads on this stuff. That means that power wash parts would just need to be dried thoroughly with compressed air or a lint-free towel, and then put right back to use. That's a very easy, effective, environmentally friendly solution for cleaning coated engine parts. I'd say the power washing test passed in flying colors. Why are we going back to the parts wall again? What are you doing, Jaffro? I thought that valve cover was clean and ready to go on the GSX. Why are you getting the valve cover down? Uh oh, why are you unwrapping it? It's clean! Right? Why are you doing that? I did some pretty extensive modifications to my valve cover's breather system. I documented it in another video. Two AM fittings were welded on and the build-up for them was sanded and polished to perfection to make them beautiful. At least I succeeded at making them beautiful on the outside. The inside's a bit ugly. Everyone who welds on cast parts finds out quickly what a disaster it is because of how porous it is. There are tiny little pores all where the casting and the welding meet, and unfortunately my modification caused the casting to weep oil. It's not a big enough leak to start a fire, but enough to dull the polished finish and be a nuisance. Everyone's seen how I keep this engine, and any kind of leak on anything is unacceptable to me. It's hard enough just to keep it polished. Well, I mentioned one of the benefits that can be gained from coating parts is that porous castings can be sealed from the inside out. That's a property of this paint that I hope to exploit here. So in order to fix this valve cover's issues, I had to grind these baffles out anyway. I didn't want to remove these baffles because they're essentially riveted to the valve cover using the casting of the valve cover itself. Grinding out the baffles is not a reversible process. They're not held in with fasteners that can be replaced. If you drilled and tapped holes for set screws, what happens when one vibrates loose and falls into your engine while it's running? Putting a baffle back requires welding, and the steel baffle you grind out of here can't be welded back onto the aluminum valve cover. So if you're paying attention in other videos, you already know how I'm going to fix this. I'm not going to do any of that in this video though. What I am going to do is grind out the baffle so that we can use this as our control subject in a motor oil drag race with the same engine oil on two different identical surfaces. You also get to see what's inside the baffles of a used valve cover and see what it looks like after the machine shop's hot tanked it.
And there it is. There's a clean side and a crusty side. I told you already, the carbon on the crusty side comes from the PCV breather port. In theory, the PCV port is supposed to block EGR gases, but in practice it's imperfect. Let's take a closer look at those welded in AN fittings. You can see the inside of the aluminum buildup welds are pretty lumpy and rough. If I get those degreased and coated, I can seal the ports from the inside so that they never leak oil again and stop distorting the beautiful polished finish on this valve cover. The carbon crust in here is pretty thick, and this was an extremely clean and well-maintained engine. So for now, I'm just going to pick out all the chunks and scrub the carbon loose just enough to produce a clean enough surface for this next test. There's no real reason to put it through the same two-stage cleaning process for this MOTOR OIL DRAG RACE HERE ON JAFFROMOBILE! The contestants are evenly matched today. We've got Castrol 10W30 not actually sponsoring our event. It's 85 degrees and about 50% humidity here in Jaffro's garage. We've got a pair of identical pipettes getting ready to line up in their lanes. Our contestants today are very evenly matched. Gliptol in the left lane, cast aluminum in the right. Our contestants line up for qualifying and... Oh, it looks like Gliptol was caught napping! Cast aluminum with a better reaction time put a thick meniscus out in front ahead of Gliptol at the 60 foot. At the 330 foot, aluminum has the advantage, but Gliptol says I'm not having it and really turns up the heat. Can he make up that difference though? Oh, he's past cast aluminum at the 8th mile! Aluminum's wide open, giving it all he's got in the right lane, but the left lane's just doing some amazing dripping right now. They looked like they'd finished neck and neck, but Gliptol's opened up a four-drop gap and oozes past the finish line, the winner! That's just incredible. Aluminum is frustrated because he knows he has the consistency to win, but simply no solution to help him take down Gliptol. Let's go down to the runoff lanes and have a word with Jeffro. I don't feel like talking. I know what you're thinking. That escalated quickly. Well, you darn tootin' it escalated quickly. I couldn't help but have some fun with it first. We'll have some more fun later, but the reason I chopped this thing up is because I need some test sample size chunks of this thing for the chemical testing that I'm about to do. Here I've got about $150 worth of stuff to run some tests and answer questions that a lot of people have asked about. I'm doing this so that none of you have to waste your time and money to answer these questions. In these bags, we have all the automotive chemicals that you're likely to find in an engine bay, and hopefully I've got enough containers to perform all of our tests with. I'm using miniature canning jars so that I can minimize the chemical waste, and to keep track of them by writing on the lids. Looks like a rat got into this one. Oh yeah, it was me. I'm the rat. I used one for the Gliptol application. So it looks like I've got 15 jars to play with. I bought a hot plate with solid cast burners to heat up some of the oil in an inappropriate container and a cheap TV tray to set it on while I do that. For the chemical testing, we've got 2 plus 2 gum cutter, non-chlorinated brake cleaner, carb cleaner, starting fluid, heat fuel dryer, Lucas oil treatment, STP fuel injector cleaner, Marvel mystery oil, Aerocroil, brake fluid, power steering fluid, Full strength antifreeze, denatured alcohol, mineral spirits, 10W30 motor oil, foamy engine degreaser, WD40, PB blaster, BG44K fuel system cleaner, and Z Max oil treatment, which I think is kind of funny because Gliptol seals the metal and this is supposed to deeply penetrate it. It was an expensive suggestion, but okay, you asked for it. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20 things to test. 16 jars. I think these five are the most likely to destroy the finish, so let's start with those first. We've got starting fluid, which is 70 30, naphtha and ether. Non chlorinated brake cleaner is mostly methanol, but contains acetone and toluene. 
Carb cleaner is naphtha solvent, alcohol, and methyl ethyl ketone. Berkabil 2 plus 2 gum cutter is the honey badger of spray solvents. You saw me blast a hornet right out of the air mid-flight in another video, dead before it hit the ground. Be careful with this stuff. Heat is 99% isopropanol. It's used as an antiseptic, as a fuel dryer, and to manufacture acetone. But some people mix it 50-50 with water and run it in their water methanol injection systems. You can read the gum cutter ingredients for yourself. I put the MSDS sheets in the description so you can see exactly how toxic all this stuff is. Yes, all of this stuff is extremely poisonous. I'm wearing an organic filtration system because I'm doing this indoors. I'm running this section of video at 400%. It took about a minute to fill up all the jars, and at 90 seconds it looks like isopropanol is doing basically nothing so far. 2 plus 2 gum cutter has already completely destroyed the finish within less than 2 minutes. The surface is detached and wrinkled. When I shake it, it disintegrates and floats in the solution. I was expecting this to work the fastest because it contains the same exact solvent that the base of Gliptol 1201 is made from. Carb cleaner hasn't compromised the surface yet at all, but it's starting to look a little bit ragged around... Ooh, yeah, it's, it, it, it goes around the edges. This looks like it's starting. Let's see how it goes. Brake cleaner seems to be pretty slack, and I don't really see anything distorting it yet. Wait a minute. Yes, I do. Look at that far edge right there. It's giving way. Let's let that keep working. Ether, let's see what you got going on here. I don't see any distortion yet at all on this one. Nothing. The edges are fine. Well, we'll let that one keep soaking. So far, the reigning champion is 2 plus 2 gum cutter. I expected all these chemicals to react because all of these solvents have a reputation for dissolving paint, but it's freakish how fast that 2 plus 2 works here. Five minutes later, the test sample in the 2 plus 2 has been completely stripped of its Gliptol coating. It lifts right off, leaving no residue behind. Five minutes, arguably less time than five minutes, but we're at the five minute mark right now. In five minutes, carb cleaner isn't far behind. The coating's just barely holding on. A few more minutes and I'm sure it'll slide right off. In five minutes submerged in brake cleaner, the coating won't even follow the test sample out of the jar. It's just got trace hints of residue that would wipe away with a rag. The coating slid off in one big piece, so all three of these chemicals are extremely reactive with this paint, just like they are with all other kinds of paint. It's just sort of what you'd expect them to do, and I'm not surprised. Carb cleaner has separated the coating enough that gently picking at it makes it slough right off. 2 plus 2 is the only chemical that shredded the coating prior to removing the sample from the jar. As we look back at the ether sample, man, really, this one's kind of making me look bad in my estimation. I'm still not seeing any reaction at all. I thought for sure it would at least discolor or etch it, but we're going to let that one keep on soaking, see what it'll do. Isopropanol is sort of disappointing me too. Whoa, wait a minute. Maybe not. Looks like we got some action here. Yep, look at that. It rippled in from the outside, finally. It took quite a bit longer, but it caused it to let go. So there you have it. Isopropanol does break down paint's ability to adhere to metal. I don't know what concentration it would require or how likely your crankcase ever is to being filled with pure isopropanol, but perhaps blow by from its use as a fuel additive in a water methanol system over a long period of time might affect it. I have no way to test that, but it's something you should consider. I'd rule out spraying carb cleaner, brake cleaner, or 2 plus 2 into a running engine that has a coated crankcase. I know the intake and combustion chamber aren't a crankcase and they're not coated anywhere, but there's blow-by and these have proved to be highly reactive. So these tests on coated parts should also help you reconsider your cleaning procedures during assembly, because these chemicals should never come anywhere near it. So for now we've ruled out four products. Half an hour later, ether still isn't doing anything. We'll just have to set that one out of the way and keep moving. We've got more jars to fill. I've cleaned out the other four and they're drying, but let's get all of them prepped and ready for the big soak. Ether might be throwing me a curveball, but I left a few that I'm expecting at least some reaction out of. First, we need a test sample in every jar, and then to fill them up and to mark them all. BG44K is sort of a pain because it comes in a can and you need a funnel to fill it, so I'll come back to that one. And there you have it. All the remaining jars are filled and marked for the long soak.
There's nothing else I can do right now but wait, so I might as well go outside and enjoy the great outdoors. What the f is that nature? What is that? A flippin' a land urchin? Someone explain. Ugh. Ew, nature, gross! What the hell is that thing? It's the next day. Never mind that I put the same shirt back on that I was wearing yesterday. It's time to safety up and get right back into our sample testing. Gloves, mask, and glasses. I'm using an electronics tool called a spudger because it's rigid and made of nylon. And I'm going to scratch each sample to see how it compares to a control sample. I've got the control sample right here. Let's give this thing a gouge and see what it does. Uh, maybe I'll press a little bit harder because that wasn't impressive at all. Sorry, my hand was blocking the shot. There's a slight hint of a scratch where I did it, and you'll have to take my word for it because I blocked the shot where I did it, but nothing scraped off of the control sample. The purpose of this test is to see if any of the coating scratches away due to it becoming saturated or softened by the chemicals the samples are soaking in. Now that I have a reference for how much pressure I should use, let's do the same thing on all 20 samples and see how tough this paint is. Let's start with the foamy engine degreaser. This is some nasty looking stuff, milky in color. It's three parts aliphatic petroleum distillates, one part kerosene, and trace amounts of petroleum naphtha, tert butyl benzene, and naphthalene. Right away after wiping it off, I see signs of a reaction. It's no longer shiny, and a scratch with the spudger shows me that my coating is softened. Some was removed and stuck to the tip of the spudger. That's a bad thing. I'm going to throw this back into the jar and let it keep working, though. Hopefully with some time it will get worse. Now let's try WD-40. WD-40 is an aliphatic hydrocarbon and petroleum oil mixture with about 10% inert, non-hazardous ingredients. A lot of people use this as a rust preventative on internal engine parts that are not in service to prevent them from rusting. Giving it a quick wipe down, it leaves the finish a little extra glossy in appearance. The scratch test produces absolutely nothing on the surface. No scratch, no separation, no problems. This petroleum oil based product doesn't affect Glyptol. Next we've got Aerocroil. It contains severely hydro-treated petroleum distillates, light petroleum distillates, monopropyl and dipropylene glycol ethers, aliphatic alcohols, and disobutyl ketone. It's mostly petroleum distillates though. A lot of the ingredients are secret, and I don't mind, I just like how well this stuff works as a penetrating oil. Nothing's quite like it. After a quick wipe down and a scratch, it looks like I scratched it, but there's nothing on the end of the spudger. It didn't etch the coating or loosen it up in any way, but the coating is definitely not coming off and it wasn't compromised. We'll throw it back in there and check on it later. Next we have PB Blaster, another penetrating oil. Its ingredients are similar to Aerocroil except that it uses heavier petroleum distillates and contains solvent naphtha and ethylated alcohols. A quick wipe down reveals a glossy finish and the only thing the scratch test did is push some of the glossy residue out of the way. I know at least one of you is going to be really happy to see this next result. Marvel Mystery Oil. After a quick wipe, the surface is glossy and looks completely normal. I gave this piece a workout with a spudger and nothing I did would leave a mark of any kind on it. The surface remained lubricated and solid. It's almost like the surface is stronger, but I have no way of verifying that. Zero marks of any kind. I'd call that a win. Lucas Oil. This stuff is thicker than three-day-old gravy. Sticky, even. This product cleans to parts no matter what they are and drips off slower than warm caramel. It makes a sticky, stringy mess as you try to clean the excess off. And that's normal. That's just what this stuff does. It's pure hydro-treated petroleum oil. 
Once I manage to get it clean, the surface doesn't look any different than the other treatments so far, and the scratch test produces nothing of significance on the surface of the coating. Nothing that doesn't just wipe away with your finger. So, like other penetrating oils, it's just pushing the lubricant oil out of the way under the pressure of the spudger. No change in the quality of the surface. Antifreeze, good old ethylene glycol. This stuff is known to dry rot plastic. Just ask any Ford F-150 lower intake manifold gasket. Of course, it takes years of heat cycles to break it down, but it's only mildly acidic. Harmful if swallowed, and pregnant women shouldn't handle it at all. I'm not a pregnant woman, so I'm going to dig in and see what happens with the scratch test. Nothing. Well, it looks like something, but, but really it's nothing. Like the oils, the market left just wipes away with your finger. Should you happen to milkshake the contents of your oil pan and crankcase, this is not going to cause Gliptol to come loose. We're halfway there, can you believe it? Next up we have brake fluid, just the regular old dot three stuff. We all know how this is going to go already, don't we? If you were betting for a total failure of the paint layer, well then you were right, because that's exactly what happened. Just like every other kind of paint, brake fluid dissolves Gliptol. Brake fluid is highly corrosive. Don't ever spill this stuff and not clean it up. There will be no paint where it drips in no time. No paint, no protection, no protection, hello corrosion. It penetrates metal and dissolves all rubber hoses that aren't properly rated for use with hydraulic fluid. We can throw another one in the bucket now. We've got five of them in there now. Power steering fluid. That's hydraulic fluid too, right? Sure it is. We'd expect this one to look like brake fluid, wouldn't we? It seems logical that we'd find the same results. But what's it going to be? Well, nothing like it so far. The Gliptol seems stuck on there really good. Only one way to know for sure, scratch test time. I gave it a really good workout and didn't leave a mark on it. Power steering fluid appears to have no effect on this coating. This is only significant as some people use Gliptol as a thread sealer. You could get away with using this on power steering lines, but not on brake lines. How about STP Fuel Injector Cleaner? This is a popular product that's been around forever, and if it can remove carbon from reduced petroleum compounds, then clearly it has a strong solvent base, right? Sure it does. Let's give it a scratch and see what it does. Nothing. Nope. 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 Nothing. Why not? Probably because fuel pumps, fuel lines, and injectors are full of plastic and rubber parts, so you'd want to use solvents to clean fuel systems that don't affect polymers. Gliptol is also a polymer. This doesn't leave a mark at all. BG44K, another fuel system cleaner. At 20 bucks a can, it differs from STP in that it not only cleans your injectors, it cleans everything your fuel touches. Pro Mechanics will tell you that it also cleans everything exhaust touches too. I've been told that it can extend the life of catalytic converters when used regularly. I've used this product for over 25 years and in most of my vehicles. Attempting to scratch it with the spudger reveals that it's well formulated not to damage polymers. Same thing observed with the test on STP. I also gave this one a workout because it's a product that I care about. Nothing I could do with a nylon stick would affect it. Now for denatured alcohol. I believe the scientific word for this is FUBARD. Denatured alcohol soaked right through the Gliptol coating and lifted it right out of the metal. This is why you use denatured alcohol for cleanup prior to welding or on journal surfaces prior to your engine's assembly. It evaporates rapidly and cleans deep into the pores of the materials that you're working with. It lifts petroleum residues, biological materials, and leaving no residue behind. Here it certainly penetrated and lifted this paint right off. So far, isopropyl, methyl, and denatured alcohols have all damaged this finish. So far, the petroleum distillates have not. Let's see if that trend continues. Mineral spirits is next. Mineral spirits, or white spirits, are cousins of turpentine, but it's a far more highly refined petroleum distillate than turpentine is. Mineral spirits are far less odiferous and evaporate more quickly, but they're not interchangeable. Turpentine is for paint. Mineral spirits can be used as a paint thinner or a drying agent in liquid paints, but mineral spirits are widely used as an automotive and industrial parts cleaner because it's the liquid form of pure carbon. It's literally purified coal oil. Scratching at it with the spudger shows that it has no effect whatsoever on the Gliptol coating. What's next? Oh, we've got Z-Max. This one's controversial, and you should do your own research. It's an oil additive that's supposed to deeply penetrate metal, and it probably does. I'm not testing its effectiveness. I'm not testing the scientific properties of it. I'm testing whether or not it penetrates and dissolves Gliptol. And guess what? 
It doesn't, not in any way. Z-Max in a Gliptol coated crankcase won't penetrate to help or harm any of the coated surfaces of your internal parts. I feel like we're full circle now because we've been through all 20 chemicals. Let's revisit some of the ones we've intended to come back to. Ether. What gives with the ether? Ether is a solvent used in chemical processing and in engine starting fluid. And color me surprised, the surface of the Gliptol is still completely intact and unaffected by the ether. Perfectly safe to spray into your intake if you coated your internal parts with Gliptol. Cool. What about the foamy engine degreaser? Well, after a full 24 hours of soaking, the coating's polymer structure is compromised, the paint's begun to expand and wrinkle, and the spudger can easily tear it away from metal parts. It soaked in and dissolved the paint. Don't use foamy engine degreasers on Gliptol coated parts. Now let's do some thermal testing. I bought this thing, might as well put it to use. I'm heating up this 10W30 motor oil so that we can revisit the motor oil drag race for a rematch. I have a pyrometer to test the temperature of the oil and ensure we're on target for testing a worst case scenario. It took a little while to find the sweet spot on the thermostat, but eventually I managed to get the oil heated up and settled to about 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees Celsius, a good bit higher than the boiling point of water. We're doing the motor oil drag race with the same hardware and rules, two equally matched pipettes delivering their payloads at the closest possible intervals in time to see which one can drip to the end the fastest. This time, I'll save you the narration and give you a timer. It's running at 400% speed to respect your time, but the counter represents exactly how long it took. The Gliptol coating was 34 seconds faster out of 101.5 total seconds elapsed. That's a little bit over 33 and one third of a percent faster of oil drainage using hot oil on Gliptol than the same hot oil used on uncoated cast aluminum. That's a result. That's a good demonstration of the benefits of oil drainage. And remember, this coating is not the only oil drainage trick that I'm using in my crankcase for this engine. Let's see if I can back that up with another pass though. Forty nine point two two versus eighty five point one zero seconds. That's forty two percent faster. So my tests show that hot oil drains between thirty three and forty two percent faster. That's a result. You saw it here. I don't know that it necessarily repels oil, but it does drain faster. There's a lot of crap that I had to go through to demonstrate this in a way so you can easily quantify what good any of this might be. And it's hard to demonstrate what goes on inside a running engine once I bolt it all back together. People have used this product for this purpose well outside of its design purpose for decades now. And I wanted to see if it lives up to the hype and does what other people have claimed. Especially before I put my neck out on the line assembling an expensive race engine with this treatment. I want to know what it can stand up to, so let's boil a coated test sample in oil for the rest of this day. After 6 hours and 250 degree oil, let's see if there's any change in the strength of this paint layer. The sample is hotter than boiling water, so let's take it over to the workbench and scratch test it. Nothing. Absolutely no effect at all on it. I can't hurt it. I learned a lot from doing this. I learned what chemical compounds seem to affect it the most. It does change what kinds of products you can use in servicing and maintenance of your vehicle, and based on its reaction with pure forms of alcohols, I would advise against using this product on engines that run alcohol-based fuels or with methanol injection. The benefits gained from this coating affect a very specific niche of problems that most street-driven engines will never experience. So my advice is this. Don't do this. Don't apply this to your engine. 
Unless you've identified one of the specific problems that this product addresses, it's more work than the benefits gained. It will change the products and the fuels you're able to use. It will not add a single horsepower or a pound of torque. It's time consuming, toxic, and difficult to apply. People have been solving oil drain back issues, oil quality issues, and oil seepage issues for decades with it. But that doesn't mean it's the only solution to these problems. Gliptol also isn't the only product that people use for this. It's being used for a purpose beyond its formulated design when you apply it to the inside of a crankcase. If you're aware of all these things by now and still do it anyway, you know the risks by now just as well as I do. So what did we learn today? We learned that if any of these products end up full strength inside your crankcase, that you're going to be fine. That means antifreeze, mineral spirits, motor oil, oil additives, power steering fluid. That should never end up in your crankcase, but if it does, you're fine. Uh, starting fluid, uh, fuel additives like injector cleaners, and uh, spray lubricants and penetrating oils. All of these things had no effect on the coating. We did the scratch test and they seemed to be fine. Um, of the chemicals that we test that didn't work, what I don't recommend that you try to do and put in this uh, crankcase would be powerful solvents like brake cleaner, carb cleaner, dip. Dips, dip! That's right, my dear! Uh, engine degreaser, denatured alcohol, pure methanol, or brake fluid. If any of those things end up inside your crankcase, you're probably going to compromise the coating in its entirety. So, you know, if you have a small traces amount of this from performing some type of service, maybe spraying it in the carb or something like that, you know, there's a chance that it could end up as blow by inside the crankcase and react. I don't know how much that chance is, and I don't have any means of testing it, but at least you know that of all the chemicals that we tested that had an effect on the coating, these are the ones you probably want to avoid using. So if you use Gliptol, it's going to limit how you service the engine or perform some of your scheduled maintenance or troubleshooting procedures if you like to use products like these. But I think if you're going to use this coating that you're probably better off steering away from stuff like that. Anyway, I hope you learned something. I enjoyed it. If you like the video, click that like button. Subscribe if you want to follow the progress here on Jaffer Mobile. And until next time, stay tubed.